had a fantastic long weekend. Kept you busy, hopefully. Um, so today we're going to continue talking about imperative programming, and we're going to introduce kind of the last piece of the puzzle here. So we've talked about uh, ways to have a computer program store and manipulate data, values, only numeric values for now, but that's the only thing that computers can re really manipulate. Um, we've talked, we've looked at ways to have computers make simple decisions, and you got a fair amount of practice with that over the weekend. So the last computer capability that we want to unlock, that we want to be able to use, is this ability to do the same thing over and over again extremely quickly. And this is, you know, again, as we talked about last week, one of the things that really makes computers special is this ability to repeat the same series of instructions over and over and over again incredibly rapidly, um, way more rapidly than you can, way more accurately than you can, um, and, and to do this is really what gives rise to all of these really exciting computer capabilities that probably led you to this room in the first place. So today we're going to start talking about the ways that we use this capability in our Java programs. So as a computer scientist, you call the process of repeating something over and over again a loop. This is a loop in the computer code. It's us going around and around again. And in order to tell your computer program that you want it to perform actions in a repeated fashion, we need some new syntax and some new Java constructs. So we're going to see some new things today in terms of, you know, last time we saw if else statements, so those were new in terms of making decisions. So we have some new uh, terminology for repeating things. So here's the simplest possible loop that I can write in Java. This is called a while loop. It's named after the keyword that I used to introduce it. So the while loop has the while keyword. Uh, there's a condition here, and we'll talk more about this in a second. And then we see something that looks familiar to us based on what we looked at last week when we saw conditionals, which is a block. This is a block of code. And that code is going to be executed repeatedly over and over and over again until this condition stops being true. And you may wonder, when is this condition going to stop being true? Because the condition is true. And so this is the simplest loop. It's also a loop that never ends. So a while loop is our first type of loop in Java. And it is the simplest type of loop in Java. That's why we talk about it first. It has two parts. It has a block of code to repeat. So you're telling the computer, telling Java, I want you to repeat this block of code, this set of instructions, and that block just like with our if-else statements, can contain anything. It can contain other loops. It can contain its own if-else statements. It can contain variable declarations and assignment and all the other things that we've looked at. So this is just another part of the program. Block of code I want to repeat. And then a condition that must be true every time that the loop is entered. So that condition inside those parentheses is rechecked every time I enter the loop. As soon as that condition becomes false, so as soon as the statement inside those parentheses that follow the while statement evaluates to false, I stop. I will not enter the loop again, and I will continue with whatever code follows that loop. So this is, you know, breaking out of the, not really breaking out of the loop. I don't continue the loop, and I fall to the bottom, and I keep going. So let's go back and look at our simple loop. I can get this to do that. So while statement, condition, in this case, the condition is true. This will always be true. I'm always going to enter the loop, code to execute. Three parts of the while loop. Let's look at a little bit more interesting one, all right? So now we're going to start one of the things we're going to be doing together this week. So to be honest, this is kind of exciting because this is really the last piece of the puzzle in terms of introducing you to the basic building blocks of imperative programming. Once we get through loops, you guys will have seen, really, all of the basic building blocks of writing computer programs. Now, do you know how to program yet? Of course not. This is sort of like introducing you to the different colors of paint in the palette. That doesn't mean that you know how to paint a beautiful picture, but these are the building blocks. And what we'll do all semester is use these together to do interesting things. All right, so here's our little code snippet. So on line one, I see something that should be familiar to you based on last week. That's a variable declaration and initialization. So I'm telling Java I want to use a variable called index. It's of type int. I'm sending it to zero. On line two, I have the first part of this new construct that we just started talking about, a while loop. So I have a while statement. And then inside 
the parentheses that follow the while. That's the condition that gets checked before I enter the loop every time. And here, I see something, again, that's familiar to me from last week. This is a, a conditional expression. I'm, uh, this is going to evaluate to true if index is less than 4, strictly less than 4, and false otherwise. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, as long as index is less than four, strictly less than four, continue to execute the code inside the loop. And what's inside the loop? Well, again, I can put anything in here, but in this small example, I have a println statement. I'm printing the value of the index. And then I'm incrementing the value of the index. So that plus plus syntax that we looked at last week. So you might, one of the things that I want you to learn how to do, and we'll have quiz questions that sort of force you to do this, as a beginning programmer, is, you know, use the computer to help you, but also think a little bit about what's happening or what you think is going to happen. So what's going to happen when this code runs? So I have this variable called index. I started off at zero. I tested against four. Is zero less than four? It is. So I enter the loop. I print its value. So I'm going to see zero printed to the console. Then I increment its value. Okay, well, I'm going to repeat. Remember, this is a while loop. So I'm going to repeat the set of instructions. So now I go back to the top. I check the condition again. What's the value of index now? One, because I incremented it on line four. Is one less than four? It is. So I, keep, I execute that block of code again. So now I print the value of the index. I increment it. This is going to happen a couple of times. When is it going to stop? What will the value of index be when I don't enter the loop again? Four. I'm going to start at zero. Then the next time I get to the top of the loop, it's going to be 1, 2, 3. When it gets to be 4, 4 is not strictly less than 4. That condition now evaluates to false. I fall out of the loop. So I go to the bottom of the loop, and I start executing whatever code follows it. And I'm going to print done. So let's see what happens when I run this. Indeed. So I print 0 the first time in the loop. 1, 2, 3. Now index is 4. I don't enter the loop, and I print done. So my first foray into having a computer repeat a series of instructions. So with great power comes great responsibility. So now you know how to have a computer repeat things over and over again. But it's usually important, almost always, when writing computer programs, to have it stop at some point. The algorithms that we're going to start writing together this week usually are going to process some amount of data or do a certain number of things. We want to stop at some point. We don't want the computer to continue to do things forever. If you write an unterminated loop, remember, your, this computer is powerful. It is your friend. It will do exactly what you tell it to do. So if you never tell it to stop, it will not stop. It will just sit there doing stuff over and over again until usually something is going to stop it. When we test your code, we set a limit on how long it can execute to handle cases like this. So if you write a loop that doesn't terminate, at some point after a couple of seconds, our test suite's going to say, you know what, this isn't working out. You know, I'm, I'm, whatever is going on in there is not going to have a good outcome. So I'm just going to stop it, um, and you're going to fail the test. It's not that hard to write a loop that won't terminate. Here's an example. OK, so it's very similar to the one that we just looked at. Another while loop. I initialize an index variable at the top. I set it to 0. I'm kind of going through here. Um, it looks very, very similar. What's the difference between this one and the previous one? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, the difference is here on line 4. So someone complained last time they couldn't see my laser pointer on the screen. So I will order like a military-grade laser. And that hopefully will not etch holes in the screen, but will be visible. Um, Anyway, for now, I'm going to try to anchor things with line numbers. So on line four, you see before I had an increment. I was doing plus plus. So index was getting bigger every time through the loop. That meant that as the loop ran, index was approaching four. So at some point, that conditional expression on line two is going to evaluate to false. In this piece of code, index is headed the wrong direction. It started out at zero, and it's getting smaller. So as the loop runs, I'm not getting closer to 4. I'm getting farther from 4. And so that condition is never going to evaluate to false. So if I run this in our little, in the tool that we use to run your code on the lecture slides, you'll see it's going to say timeout. And that's because the way this tool works is it sets a pretty low limit, actually, for the examples that we use in lecture, because there's a lot of you, and we don't have an infinite number of machines to run these. 
But this never finished, because that loop started to execute. Index went from zero to negative one and negative two, and at some point our tool said, this is enough, I'm not gonna continue to run this code. It doesn't seem to be making progress toward any sort of useful end goal. But remember the first loop we saw. So this is an easier way to write a loop that will never terminate. Now, there will be times in your life as a software developer where you will write this loop. And you might wonder why. How would I ever write this loop? And I'm gonna show you in a few minutes that there are some ways that this loop can, in fact, terminate. So this loop is not guaranteed to run forever. But, you know, I, I tell you know, the course developers that work with me and people that work with me on programming projects, whenever you write a while true loop, you gotta check yourself. You gotta think, am I 100% positive that something inside this loop is gonna make sure that it exits? I'll show you some of the ways that we can do that in a minute, but this is a dangerous construct this can very easily get out of control. So here, obviously, there's nothing going on in that loop that's gonna cause it to stop, and I'm gonna hit the timeout just like I did before. Okay, so while loops. This is a very common pattern, and we're gonna see why in a few minutes. A lot of times, one of the things I'm doing with the loop is I'm processing a series of values a series of values that are gonna be stored in something that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes is called an array. Imagine that I have, like, the human genome. All the base pairs of the human genome, and I'm going through them one at a time. So frequently, I wanna do something a specific number of times, the length of the amount of data I have to process, or sometimes I wanna use you know, some other number, like a, a smaller number. So this is a very common pattern for writing a while loop, right? or a very common pattern for writing repeated execution. How many times will this loop execute? Four. I set an index variable here that's an int to zero, and I increment it every time I go through the loop. The, the one thing that determines, so this is, I can take this and I can change it, and I can just remove the four and put in an eight. Then how many times will that loop execute? Eight. So the, the only thing that's controlling how often this executes is this variable. Because I'm starting a counter at zero, I'm incrementing it, and as soon as it gets to, to the value that I put in there, the literal value that I put in there, it stops. So, a lot of times, if all I had in the world was a while loop, I would end up doing a lot of things like this. Initialize this counter variable outside the loop, increment um, its value, check it against this condition at the top, and increment its value inside the block. So, it turns out that this type of loop is so common that it has special syntax in Java and in many other programming languages. So, meet our next type of loop. We've talked about while loops. That's one way to get a computer to do things multiple times. There's also something called a for loop. For loop syntax is a little bit more complicated. So we're gonna have to look at it together and we'll talk you know, for the next few minutes about exactly how this works. There are three parts to a for loop declaration. Well, for maybe. So the first one is the word for. So this is sort of like for a certain number of times do the following thing. The block of code that follows that declaration plays the same role as it does in a while loop. This is the code that's getting repeated over and over again. And again, I just wanna emphasize this, that block can contain anything. It can contain if else statements, it can contain while loops, for loops, it can contain variable, new variables, whatever. Anything, you can put anything inside that block. There are three parts to this declaration. But these two loops, whoops, sorry. These two loops are equivalent. So in the, in the while loop, I initialize this variable index here. In the for loop, you see it here. The while loop, I have a check that I repeat every time I enter the loop. In the for loop, that appears as the second part. These are separated by semicolons. And then I have this update inside the loop and this variable update in the for loop happens over here on the right. So from left to right, I have a variable initialization inside this, these parentheses. This is new, we haven't seen this before. Then I have a check that gets repeated every time I enter the loop. And finally, I have an update that gets repeated every time I exit the loop. So when I get to the bottom, every time I return to the top, I'm gonna update the value of index. We'll go through exactly how this works in a sec. 
But for now, let's rewrite this piece of code using a for loop. And you'll see why this construct exists, because right now, this piece of code is like seven lines long. If I write it using a for loop, I can get rid of this variable index here. I don't need my while loop anymore, and I don't need this condition down here. So this is quite a bit cleaner than the original loop. It does the exactly same thing. Let's run it and convince ourselves of that. Yeah. So this does the exactly same thing as the original while loop. But again, that, that pattern in a while loop is so common that I have a special way of writing. So this loop, and, and this, there are other ways to write a for loop, and I'm gonna show you some in a minute, but this is by far in terms of the loops that you will write in your life, 90% of them, maybe north of 90%, are going to be this exact loop. The number of times is going to vary. It's not always going to be four. Sometimes it'll be eight. Sometimes it'll depend on the length of an array or something like that. But this loop, for index equals zero, index plus one error, index plus plus, that's by far the most common. This one just rolls off your fingertips once you've been doing this for a little while. Okay. So let's try this guy. This one's a little bit different. So in this case, I have my index being initialized to two and checked against eight. Let's run this first and see what happens, okay? So you'll see here, too, that I'm using print instead of println. So this prints the character on the same line. So this prints, I think, six A's followed by the variable of index, followed by the value of index. Okay, so A, 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 eight. So let's try this guy, okay? So I'm gonna follow the pattern I followed before. Let's do this, so that, I think this is going to work, okay? Uh-oh, problem. So this is one of the differences between these two patterns of doing this that you need to be aware of. Anyone, anyone guess what the problem is? I haven't explained this to you yet, but I think some of you may be able to see it. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, the problem here is that the variable <clears throat> that I'm declaring inside my for statement is only available inside the block of code. That's different than the if statement. Sorry, than the, than the while loop. So here, if I just replace this with a literal eight, the code will run. But that variable index that's declared inside the for statement is only available inside the block of code that follows. So I can't do something like this. Okay. So like I said, you will, probably most of the loops that you will write and most of the loops that you will read are for loops. And they're a little bit more complicated than the while loop because there's three different things going on there inside the for loop declaration. So let's talk about how to parse these. You will get a lot of practice with this for the next few days. So the initialization is on the left. That's the first part. There are three parts inside the for loop declaration in Java. The initialization only happens when I reach the for loop, the first time it runs. So that's where I can set up my variables and set their values. So that gives me the chance to declare a variable that's available inside the loop. And usually that variable is counting the number of times that I've been through the loop. Not always. The conditional is the next part. It's that second part of the for loop. That is evaluated every time I enter the loop, including the first time. As soon as that conditional stops being true, I don't enter the loop. So it's possible, just like a while loop, for a for loop to execute zero times. If the condition isn't true when I reach the loop for the first time, then I'm never going to go inside of it. And I'll just fall through to the code that follows it and continue executing. Finally, the update is performed after I run the block and before the condition. So that's the other thing that's important to understand. Again, this is a little bit confusing. When I get to the bottom of the loop, bottom of the block of code that the loop is executing, when I go back to the top, I run that update statement. That's the third part of the for loop declaration. And then I recheck the condition. So let's look. Let's, look, let's go back and look at this. Well, let's look at this guy. So, when I get to line two for the first time, 
I initialize a variable, I declare and initialize a variable called index, and I set it to zero. And that variable is only available inside the loop. Now I check the condition. Is index less than four? It's true, and so I enter the loop. If I change this to be zero, the loop never executes. Why? Because I set index to zero, and then I checked. If it's less than zero, zero is not strictly less than zero, and so I never execute the code inside the loop. So it's possible to have loops, both while loops and for loops, where the code inside is never executed. So I'll change that to eight. Now I'll see I'm going to count up to eight. So I check that condition. If the condition is true, I enter the loop. So the first time through the loop, I initialize index to zero. It is zero. I check it against eight. It's less than eight. I enter the loop. I get to the bottom of the loop. When I go back to the top, I do two things. I don't redeclare the variable. So I don't do that left statement. That only gets executed once. Instead, I update it using this syntax over here, plus plus, and then I check it against eight again. Again, I know that things are happening like left to right, right to left rather than left to right, sort of confusing. Um, this statement over here, I'll show you a few more examples this season in a minute, but this can include anything. So I can do this, for example. Now what happens? So now I'm incrementing the variable by two every time. So the first time it's zero, second time I set it to two, I check it against eight, is two less than eight? Yes. Third time, I incremented by two, so now it's four. I have four less than eight. Keep doing that until I get to eight. I'm going to break out. Okay. So this is essentially the algorithm that Java is following when it executes a for loop. Check the condition. If the condition is false, just keep going. Drop to the bottom of the for loop and execute whatever is below it. If the condition is true, execute the loop block. After the block finishes, run the update statement and go back to step one. So I just repeat this over and over again until the condition is false. So also, just like a while loop, I can create for loops that execute forever. Right? So and again, these are weird. I just want to say that. These examples here are not that common. The most common example is I start a counter at zero, I increment it by one every time, and I run it up to some limit. But, you know, from time to time, you'll, particularly on our quizzes, like, you'll see example code that looks like this. So how many times is this going to run? Don't execute it. Read it. And let's, let's think it out together. So um, I get to line three, and I set, what's, my, uh, what's the variable that I'm declaring inside this for loop? What's it called? Loop. I declare it, and I initialize it to four. I'm going to run the check. Is four less than or equal to eight? It is, so I enter the loop, and I increment counter. Now I'm at the bottom of the loop. I go back to the top. What do I do to the loop variable every time I go through? I add two. So loop started out being four. Now it's six. Is six less than or equal to eight? It is, so I keep going. I increment counter again. So counter started off at zero. Then it was one. Now it's two. Now I'm at the bottom of the loop. I go back to the top. I add two. Loop was six. Now it's eight. Is eight, strict, is eight less than or equal to eight? It is. I execute again, so counter's now three. I go to the top. I add two to loop. Loop is now 10. Is 10 less than or equal to eight? No, I'm done. I'm going to print counter. So now let's run this, and we'll see that counter is three when I'm done. So that loop is executed three times. All right. And look at another one. How about this guy? I'm not going to go through all these. You guys can do these. I mean, again, these are strange. Um, but I can create loops like this. In this case, I'm creating a loop variable called i, and it actually goes down. And it goes down by three for some reason that's never explained in the problem, um, and I count it every time. What about this guy? Um, you know, again, you know, how many times will this execute? Big goose egg. Why? My loop variable is called j. It gets initialized to 2. I check the condition. Is 2 greater than or equal to 4? Nope. Done. Yeah. OK. Again, I'm not going to dwell on these next few slides, um, but it turns out that all three parts of that for loop are optional. So for example, this is a valid for loop. The variable that it's using has been declared outside the for loop. That's OK. Um, but you'll see here that I don't declare a variable inside the for loop. 
In this case, I don't update the variable inside the for statement. And in this case, this is essentially a while true loop. This will always keep executing. It does no update, it does no check. It's equivalent to while true. But don't do this in general, unless you have a really good reason. Again, these are like the weird tools at the bottom of your toolbox that you don't use very often, unless you're stuck. Most common for loop, start at zero, increment by one, run up to a certain value. If you get confused about for loops, I would encourage you try writing the same code as a while loop, and that may help you understand it a little bit better. Okay, great. Ah, okay. So inside a loop, I told you that, so right now what we've looked at are ways to control the loop execution that are contained in the loop declaration. So a while loop checks a condition, a for loop also checks a condition every time before it begins executing the block of code that constitutes the loop. But there are things I can do inside the loop to affect things as well. Probably the most useful is a statement called break. Break does what it sounds like. It breaks out of the loop immediately. It doesn't update the, it doesn't check the condition, it doesn't update the variable, it just immediately causes the loop to stop executing and your code to continue executing below the loop. And you can use that statement anywhere inside the loop. Continue is more interesting. So what continue does is it, it pretends that you got to the bottom of the loop, but it just goes back to the top immediately. It updates the condition. If it's a for loop, it'll update the variable, check the condition. If it's a while loop, it'll just check the condition again. Um, but it, it acts as if you've just jumped up to the top of the loop again and are trying to re-execute. All right, so, so here's a common, common pattern. I'm looking through some data for a particular value. In this case, this data is pretty boring. It's just a series of numbers. So what's gonna happen with this piece of code? So I've got my canonical for loop here, up here on line two. I have a loop variable. I, so in general, I is a terrible name for a variable, except if it's a loop variable. I, J, and K are traditionally used as loop variables. I for the outermost loop, J if you have a loop inside that loop, and K if you have a loop inside that loop. If you get to L, then something has gone terribly wrong, right? Please talk to the core staff. Um, Actually, if you get to K in this class, something has gone terribly wrong, right? There are times when you need a loop inside a loop. If you have a loop inside a loop inside a loop inside a loop, again, please post on the forum. Um, something, something has gone amiss. But I can use, and so I sort of a commonly used loop variable. You'll see this all over code that you read, including ours, right? A general terrible name for a variable, but has been sort of established uh, through the programming community in, for use in for loops. So I've got a loop variable called I, what is the largest number of times that this loop is going to execute based on the for loop declaration? I start at zero, I increment by one, I run up to 64. How many times will that execute? At most, 64 times, yeah. But I have code inside this loop like I promised that we could. I have an if statement. So what I'm doing is I'm checking every time I start going through the loop and I'm seeing if I is equal to the search value that I put up there. What do I do if that's the case? I print off something and I break. So that break statement is gonna cause me to immediately exit uh, ex the loop. So let's run this. And actually, let's, I'm gonna add a little bit of extra syntax here just so we print the loop variable as I go through. All right, so here's what happens. I execute the loop the first time. I is zero, is I equal to eight? No. So I print not found and I. I. Go back to the top, I increment I, now I is one, is I equal to eight? No, I print not found and the value of I. Keep doing this until I is eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the ninth time that I come through the loop, I is now eight. So I enter the if statement that starts on line three. That does two things, it prints found, and then it calls break. Break always breaks out of the innermost loop. Okay, so sometimes people get confused, they see a break inside an if statement. Breaks have no effect on an if statement. When Java executes a break, it says, I'm gonna look for a loop. What loop am I inside? So I'm on line five, I'm inside a block of code that was defined by an if statement, but that's not a loop. 
So it keeps looking. So it says, oh, okay, I'm executing a loop that starts on line two. That's the loop that I'm going to break out of. Let me put another print line down here just so that we can see that we also execute any code outside the loop when I'm done. Break, okay? So, and, and this is, you know, again, break is frequently used, like let's say you're looking through a bunch of values in a data structure we'll talk about in a minute. I'm looking for something, and as soon as I find it, I want to exit, right? Um, and, and when we talk about arrays in a few slides, this will make more sense. Continue, okay. So continue is less common than break. Of the control statements you see inside a loop, I would say in my years of reading code, 95% of them are break. But continue can be useful sometimes, so let's see what it does in this particular loop. So again, I have my canonical for loop syntax. I have a loop variable called i, that's my canonical loop variable. I run it up to four, I'm incrementing it every time. At the, on, on line two, I print going and then I print the value of i. Now if i is, once i gets to be two, and after that point, because I'm checking whether it's greater than or equal to two, I execute this continue statement on line four. What that does is it acts like I got to the bottom of the loop, but it doesn't execute any of the other code inside the loop block. So let's see what happens here. So the first time I go through the loop, i is zero, i is not greater than or equal to two, and so I print going, I, print, I do the statement on line two, and I also see the print statement on line six. But once i becomes two, look at the output. So once i becomes two, I'm executing the block that starts on line three. And I'm executing this continue statement. So the continue statement jumps back to the top of the loop. It doesn't exit the loop, it just acts like I got to the bottom, but this print statement on line six is not executed. Okay, less useful than break, but important to see. There are other ways to, you know, um, to, to sort of get, get continue-like behavior, right? Okay. So actually, this, so this is another way to do it, right? So let's go, so I can use continue sometimes to go back to the top. Sometimes that same code can be rewritten to use an if statement. So here's the same piece of code I just wrote. It's going to do the exactly same thing but it's done using an if statement instead of continue. So this piece of code and this piece of code are identical. Sometimes this is more clear, sometimes continue is more clear, it really depends on what you're doing. There are people out there, you'll find people out there on the internet that hate continue because they find it confusing. Because they're saying, oh, I'm reading your code and there's a continue statement up somewhere that I missed and I don't realize that this part of the code's not being executed. But anyway, at this, at this stage I wouldn't worry too much about it. Okay, questions about loops. You guys are going to get practice today, tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. On our next MP, well, on the first MP, which will come out on Monday, um, on using loops. Again, this completes. We've talked about how to initialize variables and use data. We've talked about how to make decisions. Now we know how to get a computer to do multiple things over and over again and control that process a little bit, which is important. Any questions before we go on? Yeah, over here. Can a loop variable be initialized outside of the loop? Indeed, it can. I think we saw an example of that right here, yeah. So if you see that first example, starts on line one, that's a case where the loop variable that's being checked inside the condition is actually initialized outside of the loop. Yeah, sometimes that's useful. Good question, other questions? Yeah. How so? So if you do that, essentially what you're doing is you're, you're, you're trying to reinitialize the same variable, right? Compiler's gonna complain. Good question. All right, so. So let's talk about something more fun. So this, this class, I mean, you guys are learning how to program. But learning how to program, learning about computer science is really learning about data and how to use data. And that's one of the most powerful capabilities that you will come out of this class with. So far. We've been talking and looking at how to manipulate single data values, single numeric data values. We've been, we can, at this point, you guys can work with single integers, single 
floating point values or decimal values, either as a double or a float, and things like characters. But that's not very interesting. It's about to get a lot more interesting. Java primitive types allow you to store and manipulate a single value. Um, but what if we want to represent multiple values? And most of the data out there in the world, so when we were writing these first couple homework problems, it was really hard to come up with things where stuff is only represented by a couple of different values, because most of the interesting data in the world is represented by multiple values. So, starting with our building blocks, I can store numbers, I can store characters, what type of interesting data can we now think about once we start to think about storing multiple values? What are the, some of the things that we can now work with? And a lot of you come from other domain areas. So I would like you to think about this from your own perspective. Yeah, what's one example? Words, yes, text, thank you. Strings, we call them strings in computer science. A string consists of multiple characters. What else? Great example. Things drawn from your own field, yeah. Pictures, what is a picture? A picture is essentially a bunch of single pixels. That's how a computer represents a, a photo. It's a bunch of numbers. If you look at your computer screen, every single tiny little dot on there is represented as a single number somewhere in your computer's memory. Once I blend a bunch of them together, I can see a whole photo, yeah. Oh yeah, so, so Java can process any kind of data. What I'm asking you guys is, what kind of things in the world that you're familiar with can you represent with multiple values? What else, yeah. What's that? Networking, well, so computers do send data across a network between each other, but again, what is this data? Yeah. Spreadsheets, okay, these are, these are tools. What's in a spreadsheet? Like, why would I create a spreadsheet in the first place, right? What do I put, I don't create a spreadsheet just for fun. Right? The spreadsheet contains some type of data. Again, you guys all come from all of these other areas. What type of data from your domain can we work with? Yeah. Survey results? I'm, yeah, I might ask people questions, like, you know, uh, what, like, different things about them. And now I have a bunch of different responses, right? Every one of those responses might be something that I can represent with a single number, right? Like, how much do you like this class, right? I hate this class, I love this class. It's a good example, what else? Yeah. Yeah, if I'm working in with math, right, like I want to represent a function, like a, a position coordinates, you know, in a, in a math axis, yeah. Music, thank you. What do you think music is? Just some random thing that comes out of your speaker that was illegally downloaded maybe from somewhere on the internet? Um, no, music is a series of values a series of measurements of pressure at a given point in time. All right, so here are some I had up on the slide. Text, right? Yes, now we can communicate. Now we can, computers can now send around our own communications, our own written language. That's tremendously important. Your own chromosomes consist of a series of base pairs drawn from this very small alphabet. So your own DNA, the human genome, I can represent as a series of characters. Any sort of time series data, right? Whether it's a measurement of the temperature, you know, in Champaign over time, right? The measurement of the speed of a runner as she runs around the track, right? Whatever, right? Anything that I care about over time. Music, thank you, fun, it's really important, right? This is how computers represent music internally. Series of measurements. So this is, again, this is about data. Once you start being able to work with multiple data values, there are all sorts of different types of data that you can work with. We'll talk more later in the semester about some of Java's other support for representing and structuring data. But it turns out, once you know arrays, you actually know how to work with a lot of stuff. So an array in Java is our first example of a data structure. It allows us to store a series of zero, which is not very useful, but you can do that, um, or multiple values of the same type. So that's an important limitation in Java that other programming languages don't all have. 
So for example, I can have an array of integers. And I can only store integers in that array. I can have an array of characters. I can only store characters in that array. Arrays are our first, but not our last, by far, example of a data structure. Arrays take data and bring structure to them. So, what do arrays do? So array contains a bunch of values. So for example, if I went, if I have an array that contains eight integers, I can just look at those integer values by themselves. But the array adds something. When we talk about data structures, typically what the data structure is doing is it's adding information. An array puts items in order. It puts them one next to each other. So for example, I could represent all the seats in this room as an array. When you guys come in and sit down, you have put yourself into my array. And there's a specific order. Even if the same people came to class on Friday and sat in a different spot, the same values but my array puts things in order and allows me to record where you sat. No, we don't actually do this, just in case you're curious. Although, I don't know, it'd sort of be interesting. Um, so when I, once I put a value in an array, it now has this other piece of data associated with it. It's called an index. It's position in the array. So by putting values into an array, I'm structuring them. I'm putting them in order. The same thing with music. If I took a song and took all the data inside and just jumbled it up, it would sound like static. The, the, the thing that's so important with music is that those measurements are in a very specific order. And when you play them back over speakers, they can have, you know, dramatic emotional impact. Okay, so how do we declare and work with arrays in Java? We have some new syntax that we're going to start looking at. Here's an example that we've seen before on line two. This is a declaration of a single integer. This is a variable called integer of type int. Here's how I declare the array. You'll see that there's this extra syntax at the front, two brackets. This is what in Java is called a single dimensional array. It stores a single series of values. We'll talk about multiple dimensional arrays in a few lectures. I can declare an array of any of the Java primitive types. So this is a single character named one. This now allows me to store an array of characters. It allows me to take a bunch of characters and put them in order, like I would want if I was saving the text of a book or a text message. Oops, sorry. So one of the important limitations, and this is gonna bother you about Java, I'm sorry if you learned Python before, uh, Java's an older language, it has some quirks. One of the quirks about Java is that when I create an array in Java, I have to tell it how many values are gonna be in that array before I start to use it. And once I do that, I can't change it later. Here's how I initialize an array that has an actual size associated with it. So on line two, the left side, so again, this is similar to what we saw with variables. There's a declaration and initialization. So the left side is the declaration. That says, hey, in my program, I want to use a variable called multiple. That variable is going to store multiple integers in an array. I'm putting them in order. And on the right side, I see some new syntax here, literally. Um, and this is something that's going to make more sense to us in a couple weeks. For now, it's something that you're just going to have to learn how to use by sort of mimicry. I see a new keyword. I see the type, int. I see brackets again. I see brackets a lot when I'm working with arrays. And I see a number, eight. So what this does is it declares an array of integers, an array of ints, called multiple that can store eight values. Down, I can split these up. So down here on line six, I'm saying, hey Java, I wanna use an array of characters named all. And then on line eight, I'm initializing that array of characters to be able to store four character values. Now again, this is not, if you've used other programming languages, it's not easy to change this afterwards. This is a limitation that many new programming languages have removed. I can also initialize arrays to store a series of values when they get started, right? So here's an example on line two. Now I have this new curly brace syntax. So this creates an array of ints called multiple that array stores the following values in the following order, one, two, five, and 10. 
You'll notice here that I don't have to tell Java how big this array is. Why not? Take a minute to think about that. Multiple is going to have what size when I'm done? Four. So what Java does is it just counts the number of values that I set in my initializer, and it says, okay, it has four values, right? Down here on line five, I'm creating an array of characters called awesome that initially has, that has, can store three characters and stores the characters C, S, and A, exclamation point in that order. Okay, I'm almost done for today, but we need to see another piece of really important syntax, which is now I've created this array of values. So now I'm putting items in order. How do I actually access the items that are inside the array? And here I use something that's called bracket syntax. So on line one, I'm creating an array. It's called twos. Its type is int. And I'm also initializing that to store three values. The first value is one, the second value is two, the third value is four. If I want to access a specific element of the array, I take the name of the array, I add a square bracket, and then I tell Java what index I want. And I can both get and set the values inside the array this way. So on line two, this print statement is going to print the first element in the array. What is the first element in the array? One. Here's the thing, though. What index am I using? You are a computer scientist now. You need to start learning to count at zero. When I index arrays, the first value is index zero. The second value is index the third value is index. So something that takes some getting used to. Sometimes computer scientists will just give up and say the zeroth value of the array. That's what we mean. So, so again, this is, we're going to talk about other data structures, but this is one of the most useful, actually, because arrays associate metadata with array. That's what every data structure does. So the data array is the contents. As we talked about, the metadata is the order. So arrays take a bunch of values and put them in a specific order in cases where the order is important. So I very quickly talked about this. We will continue with this on Friday, and you will see more examples of this again. The role of lecture is to introduce these ideas. You guys get a lot of practice on the homework problems. Let me do uh, two things. So on Monday, we're going to start counting lecture participation for real. This is going to bother some of you. It's okay. It's not that hard to get points for lecture. Four steps. Arrive on time. Follow along with the slides. Keep your computer connected to the Wi-Fi. That's important. If your computer loses the connection, we don't receive information about what slide you're looking at, and we can't give you points. And don't leave early. That's all there is to it. All right, so we have a homework problem out today. I'm going to have office hours Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 to 3 p.m. all semester. So that starts today, and it's going to just continue throughout the rest of the semester. Everything's on the calendar. We have residential office hours today in both Ike and PAR. So if you need help, those are on the calendar. Um, we have a survey out. I will see you guys all on Friday. Have a fantastic day.